Good morning. How many of you ever been to one of those meetings or maybe a, <clears throat> a training for work or I know some of you went back to school recently, so maybe it was your first day of class and they say, hey, we want to go around the room and we want you to tell everybody your name and then tell us something about yourself. Um, how many of you have been a part of something like that? Yeah, I've been a lot of those. Uh, I can remember being younger and being at the first 4-H meeting, you know, and everyone had to do this. This was something that was expected. Um, I never had a problem with it, but if you're friends with Barbara, Barbara on Facebook, apparently she had no idea I was putting this in my sermon, uh, doing this, but she shared something on Facebook yesterday. When you get in a meeting, you have to give your name and tell everybody something you like, you know, which she doesn't like that. So I figured since we've had a lot of growth uh, here at, new, at uh, Hannes Creek and a lot of new faces, I thought it would be great if we could do something like that this morning. So I figured we'd just start in the back corner and we'd just go around the room, tell us your first name and one interesting fact about yourself. Now, I'm just joking. Two people already left. I don't want to scare anybody. <laughs> I don't want to scare anybody else away. You know, the last couple of weeks been, we've been exploring the, the Trinity and we're wrapping up this mini-series today and we're going to look... You know, the first couple of weeks we were all over the place, several different verses, and today we're going to focus just on a couple of verses from the book of Exodus. And what's fascinating about just these couple of verses is God does exactly what I just said. God tells Moses his name, and then he gives him like five interesting facts about himself. And I thought it was would be great to close our series this way. This wasn't a, this was like a little quick hitter, but. I figured it'd be great to close this series this way because, ironically, these couple verses are the most quoted within the Bible. So the, when we talk about quoting verses, I'm not talking about out there in society, but the Bible, the authors of the Bible, quote this verse more than any other verse in the rest of Scripture. So before we dive into that, Let's kind of get a quick recap of where we've been. Week one, there were three things we talked about. We talked about the Trinity and all persons of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, simultaneously existing together. And we use Jesus' baptism as that example where we see all three persons of the Godhead present. We talked about they all have the same essence. So whatever it is that makes them God, they all possess that. Yet they have distinct centers of will. Uh, They have the same purpose and different roles. And then week two, that's kind of what we explored. We explored those roles of of the Trinity as they express themselves in love. And, And one of the things I said was that God the Father shows love through creation and provision. God the Son shows His love through redemption and revelation. And God the Holy Spirit shows His love through conviction, sanctification, and consolation. Now, we spent a lot of time talking about love and how love relates to God and how God is love. Um, But there's some more that we need to know about the character of God. And I think there's no better way to answer that question of like, what is God like than to look at how God describes himself? And that's what we have in Exodus chapter 34, 34, verses 6 and 7. We have a description that God uses to describe himself. And so I would encourage you to to turn to Exodus 34, 6, and 7. If you have your Bible, it would be great to make some notes. I do have it on the screen behind me. And we're going to look at this a couple different times. I'm going to break it up, kind of give you the context and the structure. I think everything kind of helps support the kind of the two main thoughts of today. So this is Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. And he passed in front of Moses, this is referencing God, and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished, and he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now, I want to give you the context of this verse because I think the context of this verse helps us understand quite a bit. So let's talk about the book of Exodus as a whole really quickly. 
Exodus is what we call a bifid. It's a two-part book. So there's two major movements in the book. Chapters 1 through 18 is part 1. Chapters 19 through 40 is part 2. And I'm just going to throw this out there, and some of you will be scratching your head. You can ask me about it later. But the book of Exodus is very Egyptian in nature. A lot of Egyptian writings have the same kind of structure, two parts. So there's two parts to this book. The first part, and and like most Egyptian writings, the first part is the divine triumph. And the second part is the royal house building. So when Egyptians would write this, this is how they would write. Divine triumph, where their gods rule, their gods reign, and then they would go out and build a temple for this god. Well, that's what we have happening in Exodus. This is how Moses wrote the book. The first part, you know, is all about how God triumphs over the Pharaoh. Through the plagues, he delivers the Israelites from slavery. And then we get to part two, and part two is all about the tabernacle. We have God making a covenant with his people, giving instructions on how to build a tabernacle, and then them completing the tabernacle. So within part two, which is where these two verses occur, there's four movements in part two. The first movement is that covenant ceremony where God enters into a relationship, a covenant agreement with his his people. This is where we get the Ten Commandments. They're part of that covenant that God makes with Israel. And then after he gives this covenant agreement, they're in, in celebration of this, Moses goes back up to Sinai, and while he's up there, God gives him the blueprints for the tabernacle. He gives specific instructions as to how he wants the tabernacle to be built. And then right after this, while they're still celebrating this new covenant, you have chapters 32 and 34 in Exodus, which is, I'll call it the golden calf debacle, right? It's the, it's the, it's the hiccup. It's the, it's the problem. So Moses is still up there, like, getting the fine details of this agreement that they've all agreed to, and they're down there making an idol. And then after this scenario, you have, they actually build the tabernacle. So the two verses that we just read that we're going to look at today, they fall in this, in this movement where the people are supposed to be in a relationship with God. They, they're afraid that Moses isn't coming back because he's been, been up on the mountain for a while. And so they rebel. They rebel against God. And so what you have is this group of people, this nation that God picked to be his representative to the rest of creation. And they rebel. Now, hopefully, some of you are probably saying, well, that that sounds familiar. (laughs) Yeah, it parallels Genesis. God created Adam and Eve to be his image bearers, to represent him to all of creation, but they chose to rebel. So in both cases... Of rebellion, we see this tension that comes into play within the nature of God. All right, and these verses that we're going to look at speak to this tension. And the tension, I think it's a tension that we feel today. The tension that really is uh, shown particular interest in this section is that tension between his mercy and his justice. The mercy of God and the justice of God become a harsh reality. And these verses really capture that. Not only in the way God describes himself, but in the context in which they find themselves. In this this story of God moving on Israel's behalf, he delivers them through the plagues, He he led them into the wilderness toward the land that he promised, they stop, he enters into a relationship with them in a covenant, in a covenant it's like a contract, And the contract recognizes the responsibilities of both parties involved. And what happens when you keep the contract and what happens when you don't keep the contract? Those are all outlined. And so they've entered into this agreement. Moses is up on the mountain. And as he's putting the final touches on this agreement, God becomes angry. He, He becomes furious. And when you read through the, if you read through the couple chapters yourself, he's, God is, is uh, he has a sense of humor. But he's, he tells Moses, he says, 
Now he doesn't say my people. He said, your people are doing something wrong. <laughs> Go check out what your people are doing. And he gets furious. He says, I'm going to destroy them. I'm just going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And Moses actually intercedes on behalf of the people. And God and Moses have this interesting conversation. And Moses essentially says this. He says, look, you know my name. I want to know you. That's what he tells God. And he, he, he even pushes it further. He's pretty bold. He says, I want to see your glory. That's what Moses tells God. And God says, all right, I'll tell you what. There's a rock. I'll take you and I'll put you in the cleft of that rock. And I will put your back to me. And I will walk by you, but you, you can only see my back. You can't see my face. If you see my face, you'll die. But I'll let you see my back. And as I walk by, I will proclaim my name to you. And that's where we have these two verses. And God passes by Moses and he says, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And I think if we stopped there, we'd be like, yes! <laughs> that's the kind of God that's easy to love. I mean, those sound great. But God doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. And so there's the tension. It's the tension between a God of grace and a God of justice, a God of mercy and a God of wrath. And there's some people that their interest in God begins to wane and they will walk away because they don't like to speak about this part of God's character. But I think if we explore this tension, it helps us understand him in a much deeper, deeper way. So before I kind of lay this out, I want to show you the structure of these two verses. If you're newer to Hannes Creek, you'll know that I like to dig pretty deep into the way things were written, why they were written, how they were written. And one of the things I always look for when I do my personal studies are what, I, what are called chiasms. There's two chiasms present in these two verses. So if you take out the, the Lord, the Lord part of verse 6, that's kind of a section of its own. And I'm just going to tell you real quick, when you see that Lord in all capital letters, it's, it's really the tetragram, um, the Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, which means I am. And so when God passes by Moses, he says, Yahweh, Yahweh. And this is from the first time Moses asked God, well, who should I tell the people you are if they ask me? And this is the response that God gave Moses. He said, tell them I am. It's an interesting, it's an interesting, it's really a verb. It's a verb. <laughs> Um, and a lot of scholars will tell you that it just means I am, and which means God is always, ever-present, eternal. But I had a professor that said that, you know, I, I, he likes that interpretation, but it could also be interpreted in any tense, the way that it's written. So it could be, I am what I am, or I will be what I will be, I was what I was, or any combination of those. And so that puts a whole new spin. It's just God saying, look, you can't understand me. You can't comprehend me. I am. And then he breaks into these chiasms. So I've kind of put this on the screen here. And when you look at this, you'll scratch your head and be like, well, I don't really see anything. that Because chiasms, usually they have some similarities on the ends. Uh, to understand this chiasm, you have to really know the Hebrew. And what's going on here is lines one and lines three. So a God compassionate and gracious, and then abundant of loyal love and faithfulness. Those lines are three words each in Hebrew, and there's some rhyming that's going on there in Hebrew. And then the middle line, slow to anger, is one word. And so you have three, one, three. And, and for those of you that maybe are new and you haven't heard me explain this before, chiasm is kind of like a bookend that holds the main point right in the middle. Uh, I've heard some people explain it like a mirror where it mirrors itself back out from the center. But in most chiasms, the most 
important point to really grasp is what's right in the middle. And so right in the middle of this chiasm, we have this idea of being slow to anger. And then verse 7 has a, another chiasm. This one's easier to see uh, in English because you can see some reflections. Um, if you notice the first and last line, there's the numbers, thousands and then third and fourth. Those are the two similar ideas. Then in the forgiver of iniquity, transgression, and sin, then you have the mirror of that is the visitor of the iniquity of the Father. And then right in the middle, which is the, the next main idea here, is yet he will surely not clear the guilty. So we see when we look at these two chiasms, the two kind of main things that God is driving home is this idea of being slow to anger, and he's, going, he's not going to clear the guilty. So we have mercy and we have justice right there. And this is the way that God describes himself. I'm a merciful God, yet I'm a just God. Now, I want to tell you, last, if you were here last week, last week was so easy to digest. Because when we talk about love, it's, easy to, it's really easy to grasp onto one of the ways that we experience God's love is through his mercy. So this idea of being slow to anger. This week, it's going to challenge you. It's going to be more difficult for you to try to comprehend uh, this aspect of God because we have a hard time thinking about wrath and justice being associated with God. Out in the society, it's really bad. Like People out in the world do not want to hear about the wrath of God at all. And it's gotten to a point that even in churches we really kind of tiptoe around this subject and we don't talk about it as much as we should because we're afraid we're going to offend people. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning, I like diving into the hard stuff, so we're talking about it. Here's one of the reasons I think we don't like to focus on God's wrath. Is we live in a culture that does not value personal accountability. We like to pass the buck whenever we can. And the wrath of God is directly tied to humanity's inability to live within the context of God's covenant guidelines. All right? So in a big picture, the wrath of God is directly tied to humanity's inability to live within the context of his covenant. But we can individualize that as well because the wrath of God is tied to our inability, my own inability to live within his guidelines. So when we think of God's justice, naturally it leaves us feeling uneasy, especially those of us that understand Romans 3.23. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. When we understand that, that we have fallen short, that we have messed up, the wrath of God is sometimes hard to think about. But it's so crucial for us to understand that God's description of himself forces us to think of him not only as creator, but also as a righteous judge. That's the picture that we get here. He is a righteous judge. Now, the way I want to describe that to you this morning is, I want you to think with me about our own judicial system here and how it works. So some of you might want to close your eyes as we do this, make it easier for you. But if, if you can imagine with your eyes open, Feel free to do it. I want you to imagine with me that you're on vacation. And while you're on vacation, someone breaks into your home and steals some of your most valuable possessions. All right, now, I'm not talking about like your television and your computer, but they take items that could never be replaced. The offender's caught, but the possessions are long gone, untraceable, never to be returned. Now, the, the offender gets the court date, their court date, and you make sure that you get to be present at that court date as well. So you show up at the courtroom, and the plaintiff lays out the case with undeniable evidence because, see, you had those little security cameras in your home that caught the person in the act. And the offender gets the opportunity to plead their case. And the offender says... Not guilty. Even though there's security camera evidence that they were in your home, they were carrying the items out, Fender says, no, still not guilty. Now, imagine yourself sitting in that courtroom and you think this is a slam dunk. We have the person on tape. 
No judge in their right mind is going to let this guy go. Now imagine the judge begins to announce his verdict. You sit on the edge of your seat waiting for justice to prevail. What would you think of a judge if these words came from his mouth? Listen, I know you're guilty. I have seen the footage on the camera. But I'm going to overlook this offense and let you off the hook and you can go free. How would that make you feel? What would go through your mind? Would you call that judge a just, righteous judge? Nobody would. Nobody would. Why? Because even within us who are broken, imperfect people, there's a desire for justice, for righteousness. So if we desire justice, why is it that we have a hard time understanding God as a just, righteous God? Well, I want to give you what I think is the answer. I believe we have a hard time understanding God as a justice, right judge because we aren't the plaintiffs, we're the offenders. So let's think about it from that perspective. Now we're sitting in the courtroom because we've committed a crime. We know that we're guilty, but we claim our innocence. And the judge begins to announce the verdict. He says, I hereby declare you guilty and sentence you to life in prison. Whoever we committed the crime against is experiencing relief because justice has been served. But what about us, the offenders? Even though we've experienced justice in that moment, we don't feel relieved because we're on the wrong side of justice. But just before the court officer takes us into custody, something unusual happens. Our attorney stands up and says, just a second, Your Honor. If everyone is agreeable... I'd like to take the punishment for my client. And the judge looks at us, the offender, and I'm going to say, yeah, I agree. (laughs) He can do it. And the judge asks the defendant, are you agreeable? How many of you would say, no, I'll just go ahead and go to prison myself? Look, what we see in these verses, in this context of these verses, is that God is both the judge and the one that's offended. We are the offenders. And the attributes that God uses to describe himself tell us what kind of judge he is. Now, look at these words here that God uses. In the context of being righteous and just. He says he's compassionate. That's a Hebrew word that originates from the word that's used to describe a mother's womb. It's used to depict the tender love of a parent for a child. And this is how God describes himself. He also uses the word gracious. Now, we hear this word a lot, gracious. We read about grace a lot in the New Testament. But here in the Old Testament, God describes himself as gracious. The word is best described as delightfully showing favor to someone who should get what they deserve. All right, so think about that. Delightfully showing favor to someone who should get what they deserve. There's some other examples of this outside of God. The Hebrew word is ken. And it's really used in the context of the story of Jacob and Esau. Now, if you know that story, Jacob deceives Esau and runs away because he's afraid Esau is going to kill him. But eventually, Jacob wants to come back home. But as he's coming back home, he's afraid that Esau is going to give him what he deserves. And so he devises this plan to send a bunch of people and a bunch of animals ahead of himself and the ones in his family that he loves the most, (laughs) and hopes that 
by the time Esau gets to him, he'll be softened. And what Jacob does when he encounters Esau is he asks for this, this word, this gracious. He asks Esau to not give him what he deserves. And Esau is gracious to Jacob. That middle word in that chiasm, slow to anger, I like this word the most. This is an interesting phrase in Hebrew, (laughs) and I'm chuckling because it reminds me of my grandpa. It literally means long of nose. That's what the Hebrew word means, long of nose. The words that are used to talk about anger in Hebrew were often hot, like heat, and nose or face. So an angry person would be a hot nose. That's what they called him in Hebrew. And so the metaphor that God is using here when he describes himself as being slow to anger is saying that the longer a person's nose is, the longer it is for them to have an outburst of anger because it takes a long time for that nose to get hot. And so God says, I'm I'm long-nosed. In the New Testament, we see Peter describing God, this aspect of God's nature this way in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Peter says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some of you understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And I think this is what God is getting at here. In the context of these people just rebelling, he has every right as a just God to destroy them like he said he was going to do. But instead, he shows patience. Why? Because his desire is repentance. So we have compassionate, gracious, slow to anger. And then we have this word uh, the NIV uses, abounding in love. Some of your translations may use faithfulness here or maybe steadfast love. They all come from the one uh, Hebrew word that's very hard to translate in English, chesed. That word combines three kind of ideas into one. So this chesed, this loving kindness, loyal love, covenant love, whatever you call it, it's the combination of love, generosity, and enduring commitment all into one attribute. And then the last word, faithfulness, is also translated different ways in English. Sometimes it's faithfulness, sometimes it's trust or trustworthiness. Um, But it captures the idea of, of essentially God is true to his word. I'm true to my word. I had this conversation on the way to school this week with the kids. Uh, Some of the things I try to do in the morning is have a short devotion with them on the way to school, and I always try to do it out of the the text I'm going to be preaching. And so I asked him, I said, guys, what does it mean for God to be faithful? What does that really mean? And they kind of gave their best answer. I said, essentially, it means that if God says it, he's going to do it. Like at creation, like he's so powerful, his words are so powerful, he speaks and things obey. He spoke and creation came into being. This is how God is. This is part of his nature. He's faithful. He's trustworthy. So if he says it, you can bank on it. You know, the promises that God made throughout the Bible are always fulfilled and they always reach their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. And I think it's fascinating where we started this series two weeks ago in John chapter 1, verse 14. We read this verse about God the Son. It says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. And then John put this in there next, and it is a direct quote of of, uh, Exodus, the way that God describes himself. He said he's full of grace and truth. And in Greek, now because we're in the New Testament, these Greek words match the Hebrew words. And so John is using this description from Exodus to describe Jesus. Now I want you to notice that all of these attributes, we have a really heavy focus on his mercy. So if we go to that chiasm, those five attributes support his mercy, this idea of him being slow to anger. 
And when we get to the other chiasm and we talk about his justice, we don't have a whole lot of attributes that support that. I mean, we just know that he's just. But there's not a way that he describes how he's just outside of visiting iniquity. I want you to also notice the difference in the numbers mentioned. He says he's a keeper of loyal love for thousands. But when he talks about iniquity, he talks about the third and the fourth. Now, some of you are saying, well, wait, that's third and fourth generations. Well, actually, in the Hebrew text, that word generations is not there. And so if we insert that in English, the third and fourth generation, we should also insert it behind the thousands. He's the keeper of loyal love for thousands of generations. I want you to notice the difference between those two ideas. And it tells us something about God. While God is just, he punishes the guilty. His desire is that many more would experience his mercy. It says he maintains love to the thousands and contrasts that to the punishing the third and the fourth. Listen, it's so hard sometimes to grasp this idea of God being just and a God of wrath. But I want you to know it cannot be denied. You read through the Bible, especially the Old Testament, you will see the wrath of God in full force. And the reason is, is because God's holiness demands both. It demands justice and it demands mercy. And what we see over and over again is that there are times when God's justice is put on hold. Because he's willing to forgive. He's willing to forgive sinfulness and rebellion. One of my favorite examples of this comes from the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 is almost a direct quote of Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Now if you don't know the book of Jonah, I'm going to give you a synopsis real quick. God asked Jonah to go to Nineveh and to and to preach a message of repentance. Jonah is an Israelite. He's part of God's people. Nineveh is not. Nineveh was a bad place. There are historical accounts of the Ninevites doing horrible things to other human beings, things you wouldn't even imagine. It's on historical record. And God asked Jonah, he says, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to proclaim a message of repentance to them. And Jonah says, nope. (laughs) And he goes the other way. And because he runs and he he tries to flee, if you grew up in church, you heard the the Sunday school story, he was swallowed by a whale. Big fish is what the Bible says. But anyway, he's swallowed. Spends three days and three nights in the stomach. He's Spit back up when he comes to his senses, he finally gives up. He's like, all right, I'll go to Nineveh. I'll go. So Jonah goes to Nineveh and eventually does what God asks. He preaches a message of repentance. And what happens? They listen. They repent. And so God doesn't punish them. And Jonah gets mad. (laughs) And this is what Jonah says in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Now listen to his prayer very carefully. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. And so Jonah is furious because, why? Well, because God's faithful. He's trustworthy. He he actually did what he said he would do because they repent. He doesn't destroy Nineveh. Jonah gets mad. So how do we make sense of all this this morning? There are patterns in the Bible that give us perspective on life. And this is what I think we've seen today in the patterns. I would write this down. We see this in Genesis. We see this in the story of the Israelites. It is over and over again the pattern we see. God acts, 
God invites, people rebel, and then we either experience God's love or his wrath. Because God's holiness will not allow him to leave sin unpunished. Here's what we have to understand. The ultimate revelation and demonstration of both the love and mercy of God and the wrath of God is seen in the cross. The cross combines God's justice and mercy into one event. Just like God acting, creating Adam and Eve, and then he invites them into this relationship and they rebel. Just like the nation of Israel where he acts on their behalf, he invites them into their relationship and they rebel. The same is true for us. God acts on all of our behalfs and he invites us into the relationship. Now listen, this death on the cross was God's action on our behalf. Before we could do anything for ourselves, this is what God does. He acts on our behalf. And after we come to understand what the cross is, he then invites us into a relationship. And we have this choice. We have this choice. Because Jesus is the attorney that says, hey, wait a minute, I want to take their punishment for them. Because God is a just God, he demands that sin be punished. And if we're agreeable, then Jesus experienced wrath on our behalf. And we experience love and mercy. But if for whatever reason we say, you know what, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't want anybody to stand in, in for me. I'm going to take it myself. Then no, you will experience the wrath of God. Because what God says is true. And that's kind of the beauty of who God is. Like He gives us a way to experience mercy, and at the same time, He's able to continue to say that He's just. So listen, I want you to understand this. This is not a scare tactic this morning. I'm not trying to scare you out of hell and into heaven. That's not what I'm trying to do. But Scripture clearly teaches that there's a balance. God's holiness is a balance of mercy and justice. And he gives us the choice as to which one we want to experience. He leaves it to us. And we're all guilty before a righteous judge. And what's worse is we're guilty against the judge himself. But the judge has provided a way for justice to be served and for us to receive mercy and experience his grace. And if there's anything that I think we should take away from this whole series about who God is, what is he like, I think this is probably it. He's willing and ready to extend forgiveness to those who recognize their own failures and ask him for grace. Now let me say that again because there's, there's one key point in there. He is willing and ready to extend forgiveness to those who recognize their own failures. And so what that means is, despite what our culture may say about personal accountability, we have to be ready to accept accountability for our own failures before we can experience His grace. Let's pray. Father, I know that this three-week series has definitely not been enough to plumb the depths of who you are. And in reality, a lifetime of studying and learning and experiencing you would still not cover all of who you are because you are so great and above anything else that we've ever known or experienced. But your desire is for us to come to know more and more about you over the course of our lifetime. And I pray that we would be willing to open our hearts, our minds, our eyes to see more of you and experience more of you. Father, help us to be accountable, to recognize where we have fallen short personally, and to be willing to receive your grace. And as we do that as a community of believers, let that demonstrate to the world that surrounds us who you really are. And I pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.